ready to dive into the word? So let's open our Bibles, uh, open to 2 Kings chapter 4. I know you were thinking Acts. Some of y'all were already ready, but um, got some hot bread for you this morning. Um, so all week, I even told you last week, I, was give, I gave you three things last week. And I was going to give you another three today. And so all week long, I'm thinking about that. And last night about 8 o'clock, um, just got the feeling that that wasn't where we were supposed to go. And the Lord just totally put a totally different message on my heart. So uh, even the PowerPoint, everything is, is just like hot off the press. How many of y'all like hot bread? You like hot bread? You like to go to O Charlie's and the butter's just dripping down the roll and... How many Krispy Kreme fans? I know we don't have that here, but how many love it? You're on Gatlinburg, and you see the Krispy Kreme light is on. Y'all know, know what that means? That means it's, it's hot, right? It's a, how many know this about heaven? The Krispy Kreme light is always on in heaven, everybody. Can we give God praise for that? And there's no calories. It's going to be good. Heaven's better than you think. So, so this morning, 2 Kings chapter 4 um, I really believe I have a word of the Lord for, uh, certainly for our seniors, but also for anyone, for everybody here this morning, especially those who are in transition. If you're in a transition time, I really believe this word is for you. Um, in, in the name of my message, 2 Kings chapter 4, is you have more than you think. You have more than you think. Um, so let's, let's read this, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. It says, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go and borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. And now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is, not, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. What an amazing story, uh, interesting story, kind of an obscure story there in the Old Testament. In fact, when the Lord put this story on my heart, it just, it just came to me, and I, I thought, I thought, you know, was that Elijah? Was that Elisha? Was that, I, I'm pretty sure that's in 2 Kings. And, and I went to f flip through my Bible to find it, and my Bible just opened up. Out of all the thousand pages in my Bible, it just opened up to that page. And I'm like, all right, all right, that's helpful. That's good. That's a little sign there. Um, and so we find this little passage here um, about this woman who's in a time of transition. Her, um, her husband has passed away. He was a, a prophet, son of the prophet. He served with Elisha. Um, and in this, they're in this time where this woman and her two sons, this widow and her two sons, are in a transition time where the God-fearing dad who had served the Lord and who had always provided, who had always been there, was now gone. Dad was the one who took care of the bills. Dad was the one who always solved the problems. And now he's gone and the income is gone. And the go-to person, whenever they had a problem, go get, go get dad, go get, go get him. He, he's now gone. And inside the house is this, this widow and her two sons who feel like uh, there are no resources. And outside the door of the house, notice it says the creditors are waiting. Outside, the creditors are waiting. They're ready to come and to take her two sons. In that day, if you couldn't pay your bills, they would, take your, your, they would make your son slaves to, to work it off. So that's what she's facing. And so many of you are in a season of transition. And what you used to depend on is not there anymore. It's, it's not there. What used to be there isn't there. To the seniors... Uh, this is a season of transition. You're, you're passing into adulthood. And what mom and dad used to always take care of, uh, you're going to have to take care of. 
Some of you are going to be moving out and living on your own. And, and uh, you're going to realize that that toilet paper doesn't just show up on the roll. It's just uh, you actually have to go and buy that and then put it, put it there. How many of y'all remember that day when you realize, oh, my goodness, you actually have to buy this stuff? And when as a kid, you just wrap it around your head. Now it's like you're counting squares. It's just like we got to make this it's, it, I remember hearing about my, my niece and when, when she first moved out on her own and she didn't, she didn't work toilet paper into the budget and salt and pepper and just the things that just always there. She'd go to restaurants and she'd just kind of see the extra roll and she's still in. So anyway, the Lord forgave her, but it, it was a, it's a new season. And, and you're used to your parents providing and being there for you, but... Um, but it's, it's, all, it's all new. And you have to learn to depend on the Lord and, and, and to, to walk with him. And for these seniors and those in transition, I, I just when I saw that there about the creditors waiting at the door, I, I thought, you know what? The world is waiting at the door, waiting at your door right now to make you its slaves. The Bible says anybody who sins is a slave to sin. And what your parents have protected you from or tried to protect you from um, that right now they're just waiting at your door to make you a slave. And, and you, you feel like the, the Lord is just right there beating at your door. And, and, and that's the season you're in. But thankfully, even though dad was gone, there was a mom that knew what to do. And so when she realized that she was in trouble and they were in trouble, notice what it says. It says that mom cried out to Elisha, saying, your servant, my husband, is dead. Here's the problem. You know, you better do something. Now, in that day, um, the, the man of God or the prophet was the mediator between the people and God. So if you wanted to go to God, you found the man of God. How many of you know today we don't have to do that? You don't have to have Pastor Troy on speed dial. Praise the Lord. I mean, you can call me. I'll be happy to pray with you. But you have one mediator between you and God, and his name is Jesus. And you can go to him 24-7. So while she cried out to the man of God, what we have to learn to do is to cry out to the Lord. Where you, when you're in trouble, pray, right? When you don't know what to do, pray. Invite Jesus to your problem. That's one of the greatest lessons you can learn as a Christian, as a young person. When, when you're in trouble, it used to be, Dad, Mom, fix my situation. When you're in trouble, listen, you have to learn to pray, to call upon the Lord. And say, God, I, I invite you, Jesus, I'm inviting you to my problem. You know, at the end of service, we always close with prayer because we want to give you the opportunity to invite Jesus to your problem. To come boldly to the throne of grace where you can get mercy and help in your time of need. And, and I, I really uh, feel like the Lord impressed me to bring this message to all of us because he wants us to recognize what you have you got to recognize what you had. Notice this verse 2. Elisha, when she calls to Elisha, he said to her, what do you want me to do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? In other words, what do we have to work with here? Creditors are at the door. What do we have to work with? A lot of times when someone comes and asks the church for, for money or for help or to help pay rent, I always ask them, well, tell me what you have. What do we have to, what, what, in other words, what do you have? And that way I can figure out what's left over. He said, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has what? Nothing. nothing. I don't have anything. Oh, really, I, I have one thing. All I have is a jar of oil. That's it. I have nothing. And, he's, and I can just imagine him saying, oh, come on, nothing? You don't have anything? Well, no, I don't have, I'm, well, I got a jar of oil. That's all I have. So she had a jar of oil uh, thankfully, it wasn't a jar of peanut butter. It was a jar of it was a jar of oil. Because here's the thing: oil was a valuable commodity in Bible times. It still is different kind of oil, but it's still still valuable. But oil was used for cooking. It was used for lighting lamps. I mean, that was their that was their way that they saw at night. It was used for cosmetics, right? It was used for medicine. It was used for anointing prophets and kings. There were multiple uses for oil. So what she had was valuable. She just didn't have much of it. Are you all with me? She just had just a little jar. What she had was valuable. She just didn't have much. Well, all through the Bible, you'll see this. And I don't have time to go through all these passages. But oil represents the Holy Spirit. 
So in that day, it was what she had was literal oil. But for us, when we look at this passage, we can, we can apply it to our situation and realize that oil represents the Holy Spirit in our lives. And what I want you to know is that if you have the Holy Spirit, you have more than enough. You have more than enough. Don't minimize the, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Young people, old people, whoever, you have the Holy Spirit. And we have to learn to value the, the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, when you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit. You did. You, the, the Bible says if, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. And so when you, when you ask Jesus into your heart, when you were born again, you were born again by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and took up residence in your jar. You, you have oil in your jar. We have this treasure, the Bible says, in earthen vessels. Jars of clay. We're just, we, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And listen, he will lead you and guide you. Jesus told his disciples when he was leaving them, he said, it's better for you that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. Listen, when, when you don't know what to do and your go-to person may not be available or they're not there anymore. Listen, you have oil in the jar. You, you have something that you don't realize you have. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. If you have God-fearing parents, I'm telling you, that's what they've been doing. When, you, when they bring their problem to you, they're praying and saying, God, what do I do? And then they come back and they sound real smart. It's because they've spent time with the Lord. But the same Holy Spirit who's in them is in you, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. The Bible says he'll show you things to come. He'll give you vision. He'll, he'll, he'll let you see how things are going to turn out. And a lot of times, young people, I remember when I was a young person, I just, I just did stuff and didn't really think about the consequences. Right? I just, I just did it. And then, the, and, and have, have me know, parents, we see things before it happens, right? We're like, we're like, don't do that. You're gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna, this is not gonna end good. Oh no, it's gonna be fine. We see it, and see, the Holy Spirit will help you in that. That He'll show you things to come before you do things. If you pray, He'll say, ah, I wouldn't do that. How many of you ever heard that? Ah. That, that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. You're getting ready to say something, and he's saying, ah, that's not going to turn out well. Don't do it. Don't do it. And sometimes we do it, and then we end up paying the consequences. Here, here's the thing. He'll give you the words to say when you don't know what to say. All these are promises about the Holy Spirit. Here's this one. He'll empower you to do what you cannot do. See, he's with you all the time. You've got one with you all the time who can empower you to do what you can't do. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Awesome. He's the doorway to the supernatural. You know you have the Holy Spirit, the doorway to the supernatural living on the inside of you. 1 Corinthians 12 says that he gives gifts, gifts of healings and miracles and words of wisdom and knowledge and all these faith when you need faith. Everything that you need, you have in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's the key to living a holy, victorious life. You see, again, to the young people, you've had your parents trying to provide boundaries and guardrails to keep you from, from driving off a cliff with your life. And, and, and you, you know, I'm sick of the rules. And now for the for once, you get to move out and you finally got some freedom. Woo, I don't have mama telling me what time I got to be home at night. I don't have, yes, I don't have to answer to my parents anymore. Well, listen, you better, you, you, you better have somebody in your life, and I would encourage you to have the Holy Spirit in your life that will, will give you boundaries, but will also give you the power to live a holy, victorious life. The fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, and goodness and gentleness and self Control. How many of you needed some self-control when you were, how many of you need it now? You, you still need it today. And we, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And what I want you to see is that in those times when you feel like you have nothing, you need to remember the jar of oil that's in the house. You need to remember the Holy Spirit. See, in this situation in, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there wasn't a supply problem. There was a container problem. See, she, if she had a tanker truck of oil, there's no problem, right? She can, she can pay all her bills with the tanker truck. The problem is she's only got a jar. What she has is valuable. She just, she just only has a small container. 
See, here's the thing. You have everything you need in the Holy Spirit. You just need to make room for more of him to work in your life. You need, you need to give him more room. You need to give, uh, make access, give him more room because if you, the more room you give him, the more value you see, the more God you see working in your life. You see, if you give him a jar, he'll fill a jar. You give him a baptistry, he'll fill a baptistry. Give him a pool, he'll fill a pool. You, you, you get to control how much of the Holy Spirit you have working and operating in your life. Notice Elisha's answer. He doesn't say you need more oil. He says you need more vessels. Look at verse 3. He said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few, and when you've come in, you'll shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour out, take your little jar, and begin to pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. In other words, the miracle took place when they, when they provided more containers for the oil to flow into. You see, there was no shortage of supply. There's never a shortage of what God can do. As, as long as there were vessels, the oil flowed. But notice this, when there were no more vessels, that's when the oil ceased. See, there's never a short. God's not going to waste anything. There's never a shortage of supply. The, the, the only shortage is, is, is our capacity to receive what God wants to do. I remember my first year of college, I went away and I've experienced this new freedom that I had longed for. And um, after a year, I had made a mess of my life. Didn't take me long. Probably, I, I made a mess about first week. But at, after a year, it, it was really, I, I was really feeling it. And I went to a church service I didn't want to be at a youth meeting type deal that I was kind of forced to go to. I thought I was an adult. I realized I still needed my parents' money. And, and, and so my parents like, no, you're going. So anyway, I, I, I went, and, and I remember at that service asking God to fill me. I was like, God, I need you. I recognized my need, and I said, Lord, please fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And, and if I've ever heard the Lord, I heard him that day, and he said, Troy, I can't fill you. You're already full. You're so full of yourself, probably full of the devil, full, full of everything. There, there was no room for God in my life. And that's really, I talked about repentance last week. That's a, a lot of repentance is just getting out the junk so you can make room for the good. You get rid of the bad so you can make room for the good. Notice he said, go find empty vessels. Right? You, you need, if you want to see God use your life, you need to come empty and come clean. Right, that's, that's what you need to, to do is, God, I'm providing you. I'm making room for you through repentance, through, through, through uh, uh, sanctification, through consecration. God, I'm making room for you so that you can fill me with your spirit. And so he said, come on, get, get as many empty vessels as you can find. And, and here's the second thing that we see. The first one is you've got to provide an empty vessel, an empty, clean vessel for God to use. But notice the second thing is that we need to expect a miracle. I think we live at the level of our expectation. And if you expect a little, you'll receive a little. If you expect a lot, you'll see God do a lot in your life. Look at this, what he said. Then he said, go and borrow vessels from everywhere. This is verse 3. From all your neighbors, empty vessels. And notice what he said. Do not gather just a few. Now, we don't talk like that, but what that means is get a bunch of them. Right? Get as many as you can find. In other words, we need to, she didn't know what was going to happen, but he's telling her, you need to expect something good. You need to get a bunch. Because here's the reality, you will have what you expect in life. How many of you grew up in the 70s, maybe 80s, and you played slug bug as a kid? Anybody who just raised your hand, slug bug? Young people, you don't know about that because you got phones, and when you're in the car, you're looking at a phone, and you got, you got your earbuds and all that. We didn't have nothing, right? We, we fought in the back seat. We, we, we wrestled. How many of you slept in the back window of the car? Come on. No seat belt, no nothing. Mom hit the brakes. You go flying to the front, and 
Young people, the reason your parents do this when they stop is because nobody wore seatbelts. I didn't know that we had seatbelts. And so that, that was what we did. And so when we were on vacation, we made up games and we looked out the window and the game we had was slug bug. Little VW bugs that were driving down. And slug bug orange, bam, first one that saw it got to punch the person next to him, right? And that's, did y'all do that? Anybody else other than me? And so... But what you realize is that, and it was a time when, when bugs were kind of going off the scene. So they were out there, but they wouldn't like everywhere. But when you're looking for them and you're expecting to see one, oh, there it comes. Slug bug orange, slug bug green. And, and it's just, we, we just, oh man, we had such a, we'd see 30, 40 slug bugs between here and Evansville, you know, just. <laughs> see, the reason we saw them is we were expecting to see them. If you want to see God move, you want to see more of the Holy Spirit in your life, you've got to expect him to move. You've got to be looking for him. And if you don't expect to see him move, you probably won't. The Bible says, according to your faith, so be it unto you. If you have faith for it, you'll, you, you might just see it. If you don't have faith for it, you're not going to see it. If you expect to walk in God's blessing, you will. If you expect to see a miracle, you will. If you believe for the fullness of the Spirit, you'll see it. If you ask the Holy Spirit to help you in your daily life and you expect Him to do it, I'm telling you, He will. If you ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, He will. That's what Jesus said. If we, being natural fathers and being you know, carnal, if we can give, our good, give good gifts to our children, how much more will your heavenly Father not give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks Him? Ask him and he will. And what I believe is there's going to be a moment in all of our lives that we realize what could have been and we'll wish that we had believed for more. I don't know if it'll be in heaven and God, we, we stand before Jesus and he, he's just like, you know, if you could have only known what could have been. Or maybe we'll realize it on this earth when we finally begin to walk in the blessings and we think about the wasted years. I don't know how many conversations I've had with people and maybe in my small group and I'm teaching them about the Holy Spirit and they've been in church for years and, and all of a sudden I see, they start to get mad. Why didn't anybody tell me about this? I'm like, I don't know, but you know, forget what's behind and let's go forward. Don't, don't go calling out your old preacher. Let, let's just move forward. But I really believe that there's a moment we're all going to realize what could have been if we'd have expected more. If we'd have actually taken God at his word. In fact, this woman sees this in verse, verse 6. And it, it says, it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. Oh, she's getting excited now. She's watching the miracle take place. The, the oil is flowing and she's filling vessels like, this is awesome. Bring me another one. And, and her son says, mom, that, that's it. That's the last one. And you know, in that moment... She's thinking, man, we should have gotten more. He told us to go everywhere. He told us to get not just a few. He told us to get a bunch if we'd have just gotten more. And I believe that there's going to be a moment in our lives when we're going to realize what we could have, the life we could have lived, the life that he really intended for us. Come on, let's do it now. Let's start today. Let's go after everything God has for us today so we don't have a moment of regret in the future. You know, one of the keys to seeing a miracle is to pour out what you have into others. I'm going to write that down. Pour out what you have. Pour into others. Notice verse 3. It said when he told him, he said, go borrow these vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors, empty vessels. Don't just gather a few. And when you have come in, you'll shut the door behind you and your sons. Then take your container and begin to pour it out into their containers. And as you pour it out, that's when you'll see the miracle. As you pour out, that's when you'll increase your own capacity. See, one of the best ways to increase your capacity for God to do more in your life is to start pouring out into others. You know, for years I was involved in a church uh, where we came together. We had church Wednesday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. That's a lot of church. And, um, and we came to receive, we expected a message every service. And at the, sometime during the service, we'd have a 
altar call. We'd pray, and we'd all come forward, and we'd want another blessing. And we'd, we'd pray, you know, four times a week. God, well, give me more, give me more, give me more. And, and there came a point where the church just kind of maxed out, maxed out at about 80 people. It maxed out at the level of anointing of what God did. Um, and you know why that is? Is because there was never any emphasis on pouring out to others. It was always about us coming and receiving, but never any focus on pouring out. And so there gets to a point where the vessel can't contain anymore. And God's not going to waste it. He's not going to keep pouring it out if it's not being used. So if you want to increase your capacity to see God do more in your life, listen, you have to start pouring out what you have. You know what the problem is? Is we never feel like we have enough. Right? We never feel like we have enough finances to give others. And even when we get a raise, we start thinking about, well, you know, we really do need that new whatever, you know, the other car was fine, but we really do need that new one. Or, or, or when we're asked to maybe help with VBS or to lead a small group or something like that, we never feel like we have enough, right? I just don't know enough Bible. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid they'll ask me something that I don't know. Well, let me take the pressure off. They will. It still happens to me. My small group loves that. They love to just think of questions that they've always wanted to know the answer to. And they, they're like, can I ask something? I'm like, no. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> or they ask me a question. I'm like, you know what? I'll tell you anything you want to know about that next week. That gives me a whole week to figure it out, right? And so we always feel like we don't have enough. But can I tell you this? When you start pouring out, you'll learn that Bible faster than you would if you, if you weren't pouring out. If you start pouring out, that'll help your prayer life. Oh, Jesus, help me. I know they're going to ask me something. And you'll pray, Holy Spirit, help me. And guess what? He will start pouring into others. To the seniors, again, if you're, if you're moving away, I want to encourage you today that the minute you show up at that new town or that new college, get connected to a church. And you start serving and you start pouring into others, you want to see a miracle start pouring into people. That's, you, know, you want to know why this church is blessed? Is because we pour into people, and God keeps blessing us. It's, um, notice this, when there was no more vessels, that's when the oil ceased. You know why churches die? Churches die when they become inward focused and they stop pouring out into others. That's the first reason. Here's the second reason. But in, in, the, in the way to fix that, by the way, let me, before I move it on to the second thing, the way to fix that is notice what he said, go to your neighbors, go everywhere and find empty vessels. The way to see God keep moving in the church is to go to your neighbors, go, go everywhere and find people who are empty that are searching to fill their vessels with everything this world has and they're still empty. They've tried everything and they're still empty and say, you know what? I think I have something that will fill you where you'll never thirst again. And his name is Jesus. And and, and let me tell you about Jesus. And as we keep doing that, the church will never die. But the second reason churches die is when there um, are no more vessels from the next generation to pour into. Right when, when the church becomes all about our generation and we don't transition and think about the next generation and, and, and then all of a sudden people start to die off and, and it's like, well, wait a minute, where, where are all the young people? Well, we didn't focus on the young people. And so as we focus on them, younger vessels to pour into. But we also need the next generation to be a willing vessel. You know, it's not just about receiving. It's about making yourself available so that God can use you as well. Becky, you can come. We're going to close right here. We have, a, I believe, a baptism at the end of service. So it's going to be a good day. Amen. It's going to be a great day. No, notice this one. You have to give God something to work with. Look at verse 3. That this, this is a scary thought, but it said the, the full ones were set aside. Look at this verse 3. It says, he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors, empty vessels. Don't gather just a few. And when you've come in, you'll shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. That's, 
That's kind of a scary thought for believers. Those who have, are full of the word, maybe full of the spirit, maybe have had great experiences with God. That the full ones who aren't pouring out to others get set aside. That there, be, there comes a moment where, where God says, if you're not going to use it, then I'm just going to set you aside. If, if you're not going to bless, if you're not going to minister, if you're not going to help others, then you just kind of get set aside. And so this morning, I, I just want to encourage us, young and old alike and everywhere in between, is that, come on, I, I want you to be full but with the intention of, Lord, I need more so that I can pour out to others. God, bless me so that I can be a blessing to others. God, I don't want to be set aside. I don't want to be full of oil but not have enough to share. I don't want to be stingy with what you give. And so God, as Brandon said earlier, sometimes we need to have heart surgery because we, we just focus on ourselves. I need more, I need more. And God says, I, you, you've got, I've got more than enough. You just got to increase your capacity by pouring into others, but also, listen, by making more room for him. You know, I, I think that we can all make more room for God in our lives. I really believe that. See, we can be, you're, you're only as full as what you make room for. If I, if I take this bottle of water, you can look up just for a moment. If I take this bottle of water, if I've got this much water in it, if I'm going to fill it with oil, I can only get that much in. But if I pour the water out, I just made room for more oil. Are you all with me? And so if you're so full of everything, your plans, your dreams, your desires, your work, your hobbies, your family, all these. And they can all be great things, but if you don't have any room for God, then listen, there's only so much of the Holy Spirit. There's only so much anointing you can receive. But when we turn off the TV and we push our plate back and we look at our schedule and we say, you know what, I've been too busy. I've done too. And listen, I have to do this a lot and I have to stop every now and say, you know what, I'm too busy. I've done too much. I've, I've taken on too many responsibilities. And I've got to pull back and make room so God can do more. And so this morning, I just I want to encourage you to, to leave with the attitude of I need to serve. And God, I want to make more room for you in my life. I want to make room for you in my schedule. Because here's the... Here's the reality. There's no shortage of supply. I love this in Zechariah 4 when Zechariah has this vision. And, and the angel asks Zechariah, he said, what do you see? And he says, I, I see that there's this lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. Imagine that. You can just close your eyes. Picture this. This big lampstand has a big bowl on the top of it. Now, remember, lamps didn't have electricity. They were, they were they, fueled by oil. And it says they had seven lamps and seven pipes to the seven lamps and there were two olive trees beside it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at the left. In other words, that the supply of the oil was not a jar or a container, it was two olive trees. In other words, there was a constant flow, a constant supply that, that God had. And the angel talked with Zechariah and said to him, do you know what these are? And he said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to, do, to Zerubbabel. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And in that moment, Zerubbabel was facing this, this huge mountain. And the Lord said, thus says the Lord of hosts, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Listen, some of you today, you're facing a mountain and what you need, you need more of the Lord. It's because you're not going to achieve this by your might or your power. 
Young people, as you're going into the world, listen, you're not going to be able to make it by your might or your power. It's only going to be by the Holy Spirit. And it's in those moments that you realize that there's not a shortage of supply. That there's an abundant supply. And the mountains that are before you, are, are God's plan is for them to come down before you, but it'll be by the work of the Holy Spirit. It'll be by the power of grace. Listen, if you're here this morning and maybe you're in a time of transition, maybe you're facing a mountain and you realize it's more than what you can do. And you realize it's not by your might or by your power. It's only by the Holy Spirit. And you say, you know what? I want to make room for more. God, I recognize I need more today. I want to make room for you. Come on, would you just stand to your feet? You say, you know what? I, I know I need more. I'm facing something that I realize I'm not enough. I need more. And listen, if that's you today and you say, you know what? I'm facing something. I know I need more than what I have right now, but I know that I have enough. I know I have enough Holy Spirit. I just want to make room for him to do more. Listen, this morning, you have more than you think. And as this song begins to play, I just want to encourage you to slip out of your seat and come and just pray. Have a transaction with God. Let him fill you. Let him give you what you need. Let him give you the wisdom, the resources, the strength, the grace, the refreshing. Some of you are tired and you just need a time of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.